Hi, good afternoon everyone. Hope you're having a very nice day. This is Ali Fernandez, International Business Development Manager at the Tampa Hillsboro EDC. And I'd like to welcome you to our March Compass Webinar Series. This month we're joining forces with our partners at Port Tampa Bay and Pinellas County Economic Development. The topic for today is Foreign Trade Zones, the Competitive Advantage Your Company Needs. Now before we start, let's do a couple of housekeeping rules. On your screen, you can see a chat box. Please type in your questions and we will try to answer them at the end of our presentation. For those of you that might be new to the Tampa Hillsborough EDC and what we do, let me do just a, a brief overview. Our mission at the Tampa Hillsborough Economic Development Corporation is to develop and sustain a thriving local economy by focusing on the attraction, expansion, and retention of high-wage jobs and capital investment. Our vision is to be recognized nationally as a community transformed by job growth, business innovation, and international trade. Our values are our vision to think big, our teamwork and collaboration, our pride in our community, integrity to do the right thing, and hold ourselves accountable for results. What do we do? We focus on recruitment and aim to generate and manage out-of-market prospect business activity. We provide support to existing local business businesses via our retention and expansion programs. Our international team focuses on identifying opportunities for trade and foreign investment. Our research team identifies and analyzes critical data, statistics, and market trends. Our investors relations team's mission is to build private sector support for the programs and initiatives for the EDC. And finally, our award-winning marketing team strives to create a positive image for our community and organization. Today, as part of the Tampa Hillsborough EDC webinar series, we have two very special guests, Brent Barkway, Business Development Manager at Pinellas County Economic Development. Brent is an active member of the NAFDC, active member of the IEDC, and a certified global business professional. We also have Tori Chambliss, Manager, FTC and Business Cargo Development at Port Tampa Bay. Tori is a member of Board of Directors of the NAFDC, Licensed Customs Broker and Accredited Zone Specialist. Now, without further ado, let's start off the webinar with Brent. Please welcome Brent Barkway. Thanks, Ali. And I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. We're going to get started right away with kind of a, a quick overview of, uh, of, of what foreign trade zones are and what they do. As Ali mentioned, I, my name is Brent Barkway, and we'll be joined by my uh, colleague, Tori Chambliss, here in a little while. So let's jump right into it today. I, kind of the goals for today's uh, webinar. Uh, first, explain what a foreign trade zone is, what it does, kind of give you an overview. We're not going to get too much down into the weeds because this uh, could be as complicated as you wanted to make it. So right now, we're just going to kind of give you the benefits of, of what it is and what it does. We're going to explain a little bit um, how it's beneficial to U.S. international trade. And then next after that, we will bring on Tori, who's going to demonstrate the Tampa Bay uh, Foreign Trade Zone project and how it helps our regional companies. So first and foremost, what is it? Why was it designed? It is a federally sponsored uh, program enacted in 1934. Uh, it, it was designed kind of at the end of the, the Great Depression as a way to make, as to make American products more competitive, revitalize trade. Um, it's a way to encourage retention and domestic business activity. Again, uh, touching on the fact that Coming out of the Depression, we really needed a way to get American products back into the marketplace. It expedites and encourages exports, and it helps attract offshore activity. This is kind of the 10,000-foot level on this. As, we'll, as we go on further today, we'll, we'll go into a little more about what it does. Foreign trade zones are overseen by a federally created board. It's the Foreign Trade Zones Board which is a combination of the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, the day-to-day the -day oversight is provided by U.S. Customs. Uh, so 
when you do get active, when you get, when you want to apply for zone status, those are the the agencies involved. You would actually get approved by the Federal Trade Zones Board, and then the second part of that then would be activated by the Customs and Border Protection. So it's a it's a two part process, and then there's some local partners uh, that filter down from there. So kind of the the actual definition of foreign trade zones. It's a secured physical location or site within the United States, but technically considered, and this is for cus or for uh, tariff purposes, uh, technically considered outside of customs territory for the for uh, U.S. duty purposes. So that's kind of the broad overview of it. It's a, it is a physical location. Uh, typically, what you have in foreign trade zones are, are going to fall under two general categories that will usually be a distributor or a manufacturer. Uh, distributors are exactly what it sounds like. It's gonna, they're going to have products going in and out. Uh, the, the manufacturers themselves are, uh, they make a product, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit more involved for a manufacturer to get, to get uh, approved for for a foreign trade zone status it's, it just takes a little bit longer because the government likes to know what you're what you're making what you're doing distributors uh typically a 30-day process or so for foreign trade zone board approval and then the customs takes a little bit longer so traditionally they have been uh, located at ports of entry along waterways along the coasts but i think what we're seeing now is uh with the with the invent of inland uh, distribution centers. Uh, we're seeing more and more foreign trade zones get activated with, uh, as you have big, lar you know, large distribution hubs that have a lot of truck and train traffic going in and out. So that's that's been one of the changes we've seen. They are located within the geographical territory of the United States. There are similar programs in other countries. Uh, you'll hear them referred to as like free trade zones or something like that. But typically in the U.S. you'll hear them called foreign trade zones, but the, the terms are, are somewhat interchangeable. Uh, customs, as I said, provides a day-to-day -day operation. And you'll see that last point on there where it says a physical location must be a secure location. Now, what that means is there must be an accounting of what's going in and out of the zone at all times. So you would fill out reports. Uh, they want to know what's coming in, what's going out, and you need to know at any given time what you have in your inventory, where it's gone, and where it's coming from. Why are they a business asset? Uh, you know, as we had said before, it's really, uh, there's several different components to this. First and foremost, when you hear about uh, tariff relief, uh, people use it as a cash management tool, as you, as you know, products are coming in. If you're typically paying tariffs on the products that come in, this is a way really to, to hold on to your money until those products enter the U.S. commerce. Uh, so that really is uh, a way to manage your cash and hold on to it a little bit longer. That works well for, uh, for instance, seasonal operations. If you are, if you are increasing your inventory in October and you sell most of your products around Christmas time, uh, obviously that would be a large cash management tool because you're not paying tariffs on that until you actually leave the, those products, leave your warehouse and then enter the U.S. commerce. So that, that's a, a, that can be a really helpful thing to businesses. Um, just about anything can be done within the site. Uh, you can see a large list there on this slide that just came up. Assembled, packaged, manufactured. There are some different rules, as I said, for manufacturing. There's something called kitting, which you hear about, which is basically, you know, you're you're taking one product from one person and one product from the other, and if you're putting it into a gift box for Christmas, I mean, that's that's so just about anything can be done, uh, and that would all be covered in the application process. Uh, it, it, and as, as I said, the, the, the tariff regulations apply once the merchandise leaves the F, FTZ and formally enters the U.S. territory. So an important point on that, too, and we'll get into it a little bit more, is if you are re-exporting products, if you're bringing in products from other countries and then turning around and re-exporting them, they technically will not enter U.S. commerce, and in most cases, well, you would not pay a tariff at all or a duty at all in most cases. And so 
that's good to know if that's a large part of your business uh, it becomes even more important you're not just deferring duty on that you're actually uh, not paying it at all so that's a another thing to check check into there so the basic benefits uh, defer reduce and eliminate duty deferral I just talked a little bit about uh, being a cash management tool uh, duty reduction, what's commonly referred to as inverted tax relief. That gets a little bit more technical, but in its basic terms, I mean, if you think of, for instance, uh, car manufacturers, automobile, automobile manufacturers will use this a lot. Instead of bringing in all of these parts from all over the world and paying a tariff on each one, they're deferring all of those tariffs, and then what they're paying on is tariff on a car when that enter or when that leaves their facility. So, and then you have the option of paying either the rate on what it would be a car or what would be the parts themselves. So, that it, it's it's a little more complicated than that, but basically that's kind of the the, the definition of of the inverted tax relief. Uh, it, it really does allow you a way to pay lower tariffs because what happens is the product that you're putting out, and from the, from the government standpoint, anything manufacturing means you're changing changing the, uh, the HTS code or the export code on on the product. Uh, whatever is the lower one, that's what you're going to pay when it goes out. So. Duty elimination on exports, uh, we already talked about that. That's what re-exporting, what I just covered a minute ago. If you are if you're bringing in product and uh, from other countries and then you're manipulating it somehow and then you're putting it out to other countries, uh, you would most likely not pay duty on that at all. So under that, you'll see elimination on scrap and waste. I think uh, one of the larger uh, industries that use this technique is, uh, for, for instance, petroleum, where they have a lot of evaporation of their product that's coming through the port or through their facility, uh, they're only paying duties on what is going out, knowing that what is coming in is going to, uh, they're going to suffer some loss on that through things like evaporation. So, One of the, the big benefits these days uh, is, is called weekly entry. So you'll see that on the, the third point down. So from a merchandise uh, fee that you, merchandise fee you pay, customs, you're going to pay 3.64% uh, merchandise processing fee to customs when it comes through, and that's the value of the merchandise. It's going to be a minimum of $25 or up to $485, and then not to mention your brokerage fees that you're going to pay with weekly entry as a foreign trade zone. Uh, you will actually pay that once a week. So in, it's, it's in, in basic terms, again, let's say you're bringing in five truckloads into your facility and you're going to pay the maximum amount of $485 a week on that. So you'll be paying over $2,400 a week just in merchandise processing fees. With weekly entry, uh, you're going to pay one fee a week even if you're bringing in five or ten containers. And on five containers, you're going to save $2,000 a week in bringing those in. So that's that can be a huge value and that alone is enough for a lot of companies these days to actually uh, get involved in the zone program and then also uh, direct delivery you'll see which is another huge benefit so typically as your as your product comes in now it needs to be cleared by customs it comes in and sometimes it can, can hung up in customs uh, with direct delivery this actually comes right to your back door and then you report to customs what you have so for companies that are uh, doing just-in-time shipping or, or you know frequently have frequently have products held up in customs, that can be actually another very large benefit in doing that. And as far as the last point, we've already covered that uh, a couple times, so I will skip over that. So some of the benefits to, uh, national benefits to, the, to, to this program, uh, U.S.-based producers have less incentive to move operations overseas. I mean, it's no secret that a lot of uh, products can be made more cheaply in other countries uh, and so this is kind of a way of leveling the playing field for US manufacturers uh, and, and, and once again providing a little bit of relief on, on the fees and tariffs uh, that they're that they're paying on this So just kind of level the level the field so people can't other countries can't come in and, and sell sell products much more cheaply than American products 
uh, local communities. This, this is a, a great tool for uh, people like what I do, the economic development organizations in different communities to attract investment into, into the community because once again, they can offer this benefit to incoming distributors and manufacturers. Uh, the, the, the exports to global markets, like I say, some of these are, are kind of repetitive, but you know, they, they make U.S. goods more cost effective and more competitive and that's just the easiest way to say it. So, and it keeps well-paying, sustainable jobs in the U.S., and, and that's what we're all trying to do anymore. So if it, if it keeps manufacturing jobs here or keeps manufacturing here, then it keeps the jobs here, too. So that's what we're all trying to accomplish these days. So, And lastly, if you're, if you're kind of wondering if this, if this is something that you – and you don't have to. You'll see this last slide. There's a number of points in here. You wouldn't have to qualify for every single point, but certainly a good starting point for for looking at this and wondering if this might work for your business. Uh, are you a manufacturer, a distributor? Do you do, do you assemble or process imports? Um, do you export previously imported material? These are just all questions you should ask yourself. Merchandise processing fees. Do you typically pay more than four hundred and five eighty-five dollars a week in processing fees? Uh, do you wait long periods of time for orders to get through customs? And then also, do you scrap, reject, destroy, waste, or return some of your imports? And by return, what I mean on that is if you, if you are a company who, let's say you get products from China, uh, sometimes you get them and they aren't up to your company standards, you have to turn around and return those to them. Uh, that, that can be a big help too because you wouldn't be paying the, paying the imports or the fees. So with that, that's just kind of a general overview of, of what the programs are. And at this point, I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Tori Chambliss, who's going to kind of go into a little more detail about how these specifically can help, the, help a company and uh, the Tampa Bay Foreign Trade Zone project that he is, that he is uh, getting behind right now. So with that, uh, here's Tori Chambliss. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tori Chambliss. As my colleague, Mr. Brent Barkway, just mentioned, I will be honest with you, this is my first webinar, so I'm kind of excited, but I'm just not sure how to interact with people I don't see. So we're going to try to make this work. We're going to approach this part of the conversation from a company-centric and also economic development perspective. Uh, the first image that you see on the screen is an image of the geographical reach of the Foreign Trade Zone project here in the Tampa Bay market. By federal regulation, as Brent mentioned earlier, this is a federally sponsored program, and so the reach that we have in this market uh, comes from the federal level. So you can see a, uh, a circle with the radius. There's a 90-mile, a 60-mile radius, and the squiggly lines on the outside of the map is a 90-minute drive time. And that's where we got to talk about the, the first point. Uh, the FTZ essentially covers all of Tampa Bay and the I-4 corridor. Now, that does not mean that every warehouse or physical location that Brent mentioned in his part of the presentation is considered a foreign trade zone site. What that says is each individual warehouse or manufacturing plant located within that shaded area on the map can apply to become a foreign trade zone site. And we will have, Brent and I will have the opportunity to help that company start up that operation, just so that is clear. Uh, to the third point, the Tampa Bay program grants companies in our region access to the FTZ benefits, as I mentioned, and the FTZ experts, which Brent and I are in this region. And just to make it clear, the FTZ benefits do not limit themselves to goods that are moving via sea or land or air. It covers any mode of transportation as long as the goods are imported into this country and to some extent receive the benefit if they are exported outside of this country. So we, although I work at Port Tampa Bay, the goods can arrive by sea 
or by the Tampa International Airport or come over land, say, for instance, from Mexico or Canada. We also have some commodities coming in via pipeline. Uh, it's a very interesting program. And to the last point, in which we'll get into uh, in a little bit more detail in the following slides, this is a very company and com commodity-centric program, although it does have some tenets that relate well with economic development efforts from a macro standpoint, this program was designed to be very micro-centric and help individual companies succeed. So is that, how exactly does this work? Well, we do have to remember that the FTZ program is simply a part of the larger international trading strategy of an individual company. And so this entire strategy involves a number of different players. You have ports, railroads, freight forwarders and brokers, uh, carriers, shippers, longshoremen, etc. And each of these individual players add a factor, and to some extent a cost factor, into the import strategy. Now where you see the customs agencies on your slide, as well as the warehousing and CFS operators, this is where the FTZ program comes into play and can really minimize your importation and exportation costs and maximize your importation or international trading strategy. Now, what I mean that this is a company-centric program, we mean that this program is focused on the company that imports a tangible good. And that's one thing we must realize. In our model, although there are different models across the globe, the U.S. model is based on a company that is importing a good that you can actually hold. It is the, this program does not lend itself well to any type of service-based industry. The challenge that we have with that is that there are over 17,000 unique identification codes for every tangible good that comes into this U.S. market, and that is based on a harmonized tariff schedule of the United States of America. And every tangible item that comes into the United States must be formally registered with the customs territory within to enter the customs territory of the United States of America. This just begins to add layers upon layers about the the complication of how an import strategy, international strategy, can actually play within a company's overall operations. But once you understand that entire platform, that is when the FTZ program can buy, can provide a significant benefit to your importation, exportation, and international trade strategy. For instance. The potentiality to benefit from the FTZ program will be contingent upon some of the following points that are bring up. And we're gonna go one by one just so we ensure that we are not oversaturating you with what with information. One, the type of commodity being imported. And since I work in Port Tampa Bay, I have uh, the opportunity to see a number of different products that are being imported on a day-to-day -day basis. And many of these products are going through the foreign trade zone program in Tampa Bay. Here are some of the products. I have coconut oil, bulldozers, steel, beauty, beauty products, and toys. All of these products, as I mentioned, they're all tangible products. They're all being imported by an individual company into this, into this country which lends them the, the chance to benefit from the FTZ program. As Brent mentioned earlier on one of the earlier slides, the three principal players in the foreign trade zone program is the Department of Treasury, Department of Commerce, and Customs and Border Protection. However, there are entities in the federal government, they are called partner government agencies that help regulate the goods that come into our country. So for instance, I'm sure many of you are familiar with entities such as the USDA or EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, International Trade Commission is the ITC, um, FDA, and the CPSC, which is Consumer Monitor Consumer Products. And each one of these agencies gives Customs and Border Protection the direction on how they should regulate those goods or allow those goods to enter the country or not, depending on the individual regulations of those individual agencies. Also, it comes into play is where the commodity being where from where the commodity is being imported. Um, in our market, 
we have goods coming from Indonesia, Trinidad, Vietnam, Switzerland, and China. And it has, it was, I was kind enough to put these type of commodities in relation to the initial commodities that you saw on the first bullet point. So the coconut oil in our example is coming from Indonesia. The bulldozers, some of them are coming from Trinidad. Uh, the steel, a lot of it's come from Vietnam. Beauty products from Switzerland, and the toys are coming from China. The quantity of the com commodity that is being imported does have some effect on the potentiality to benefit from the FTC program. For instance, if you're bringing in goods in bulk or parcels or high and heavy equipment, that will all determine how effective the FTC program can be for your operations. And when you combine that with the timing of that imported commodity, for instance, can it be a one-off or is it consistent on a monthly basis or the seasonal, as Brent mentioned earlier? These, very, these various points all affect how the FTC program can work in your operation. And as we go into the deeper, into the further slides, I will show you examples of exactly how that works. And there are many different other variables that we can go into, but I don't want to bore you to death. But for example, the INCO terms or the terms of sale can really be a determining factor of how much the FTC program can benefit your operation. So here's an example of how the foreign trade zone work in relationship with the partner government agencies and the internationality of the product that is imported but subsequently admitted into a foreign trade zone site. As Brent mentioned earlier, once a good is admitted into a foreign trade zone site, it is still considered outside the customs territory of the United States of America, which means that it means that individual good does not have to comply with all of the government regulatory regulations for that individual product. Now, when I say all, I say that uh, between quotations or air quotes, uh, there are still some government regulations that apply to everything that, in, that is imported into this country, but there are some ex ex uh, exceptions. For instance, labeling. If, a, if an importer imports merchandise that does not meet the labeling requirements for imported products, the importer may be able to admit the merchandise into an FTZ site in order to comply with the proper labeling regulations. And this is a benefit that the American gov government gives us. As many of you do on a daily basis, I assume, you go to the, gro to the grocery market and you look at the product in which you're going to purchase. And on those uh, labels of the product, you have a good amount of information that tells you the nutritional value of that commodity, where the commodity came from, if it was a mixed or symbol or blended, with different type of products from different parts of the globe, et cetera. This is the government making sure that we are knowledgeable consumers of the things that we are consuming. And so if a good comes in and it is not properly labeled, the FT FTZ project can be used to apply the proper labels, and then those goods can be subsequently formally entered into the United States Customs Territory. And when that occurs, all applicable duties, taxes and, taxes, and fees will be payable. Another example is manufacturing. We're going to go through this one step by step just so, once again, we don't lose you. This, this program can become a little bit uh, detailed as we get deeper and deeper into the weeds. We want to try to make sure that this is a simple example for you. So here we go. Company number one manufactures product number one. In order to pro manufacture product number one, company number one needs to import a couple of uh, raw materials. And we would call these raw materials input A and input B. And so from our simple equation, we have input A plus input B equals product number one. Now, the duty rates that apply to imports A, B, and product number one are as follows. Import A carries a 10% duty rate. Import B carries a 10% duty rate. While product number one, the finished product from imports, inputs A and B, carry a 0% duty rate. 
the total import value of the inputs that we will use to manufacture product number one is one million dollars. So applying that to our equation, we have input A, uh, about $500,000 worth of input A plus $500,000 of input B equals product number one, which will come out to be a million dollars. Operating outside an FTZ environment, the comp company number one must pay $100,000 in duties to manufacture product number one. And why does this occur? Because in a normal trading environment, as I mentioned earlier, every commodity that is imported into the United States of America must be registered with the United States government. Therefore, if a product has an company duty rate, that, rate, that duty must be paid prior to that good clearing customs and entering the company's facility for production. Inside an, an FTZ environment, company number one can import, between quotations, both inputs A and B, manufacture product number one before paying $100,000 in duties. Now why can this occur? We will repeat what we mentioned earlier because within a foreign trade zone environment, you are considered outside the customs territory of the United States of America. And so some laws, and in this case, the applicability of paying duties do not apply, you will not have to pay those duties. After the manufacturing process, company number one will import product number one, which is the finished product. And at that point in time, they will pay the applicable duty rate that is affiliated with product number one, which is 0%, which we mentioned in earlier in our example. There's a total savings of $100,000. Now you can imagine, as companies grow, every, every company begins to think along the lines of economies of scale. So as you input more, import more and manufacture more, uh, you can see how this simple example can grow the amount of savings, financial savings that your company can receive. And what exactly does the extra $100,000 mean for a company expanding its international operations? You have to understand, as Brent mentioned earlier, the purpose of the FTZ program is to help American companies compete in the international playing field. There are companies and countries across the globe that have a number of strengths and weaknesses that are you know, competitive to ours, such as labor costs or transportation or, or government subsidies, etc. But the FTC programs al allows you to save money in order to compete in that market. And so with an extra $100,000, you can encourage retention and domestic business activity. You can reinvest in your company uh, to satisfy the additional foreign demand that you are generating as operations within your company. You can hire additional domestic employees, which is always good as we hear in our, our current um, economic environment. We always want more jobs to stay in the United States. Or we can purchase additional needed equipment that can help with our manufacturing process. It also expedites and encourages exports. With that extra $100,000, we can increase our in-person visits to market in order to make sure that we have a firm relationship with our counterparts in our foreign markets. We can in increase radio, television, digital marketing efforts within that market to help establish a larger, pre a larger presence, presence for our goods within that market. Or we can simply export more of our commodities in a more frequent, frequent basis. And at the end of the day, we create jobs and invest in the United States, which could otherwise happen outside of this country. The FTC program helps attract offshore activity. We're reshoring an FDI attraction. There are examples of companies doing this currently in our marketplace in Tampa Bay as well as outside of Tampa Bay. Some of the larger companies that you will be familiar with would be BMW, Nissan, there are also pharmaceutical companies, Ab uh, Apple, they're also part of the FTZ program. Uh, companies in our market include shipbuilders, beauty, uh, companies that distribute beauty products, um, citrus companies, etc. 
And from this FTZ activity, all of these companies are hiring additional domestic employees. So you can see the benefit of the FTZ program helps company compete in the international marketplace, but also helps the American economy from a larger viewpoint because it helps generate jobs. Now, I know you're just dying to ask, after this amazing presentation from my esteemed colleague and myself, how can my company or how can my friend's company become part of the FTZ program in Tampa Bay? And the simple answer is to contact either myself, Tori Chambliss, or Mr. Brent Barkway. Uh, we will help you decipher if the FTC program can be beneficial to your operations. As we mentioned before, there are a number of different variables that, that play, that come into play when you try to decide if the FTC project can work in your benefit. So from an initial contact, Brent and I can offer a, a conversational analysis from the information that you provide us. But if you decide to go forward, we can provide a more detailed analysis, both qualitative and quantitative, to help you see if this FTZ program can be beneficial to you. Now, some of the examples that we mentioned kind of circled around the financial benefits, but there are also non-financial benefits that play an important role in this FTZ program. There are logistical benefits, there are compli compliance benefits, as we mentioned, with the, with the labeling. Uh, direct delivery, which is logistical benefit. So we don't have to look in terms of explicit benefits. There's also implicit benefits to this program that we can help decipher. And in the long term, if you decide to become an FTZ operator, your homework will be to become the FTZ specialist for your company. Because at the end of the day, although Brent and I can help walk you through the program and help you understand exactly how it works and how it can benefit your company, you, someone within the company, will need to know how it affects your company on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if you are the individual that are contacting us to make sure that it can be beneficial to your company, we will help you become that FTZ expert within your own company, which will help you understand which regulations of U.S. trade policy affect your company, and overall, how would the FTZ operation affect your current operating procedures and your future expansion plans? With that, I believe we have come to an end. Now you have our amazing pictures on your screen. Please feel free to contact us whenever you have an opportunity. But I believe at this point we are opening up for questions. And if there are any questions, I believe we should have some in the chat box. Please type away. First question is, what is the cost to set up an FTZ in our facility? There are a number of different variables that come into play when you try to determine the cost to set up an FTZ operation within your facility. Some of those costs are easily identifiable. Those would be the application fees, the long-term perpetual payments that you will have to pay in order to uh, maintain your FTZ status. And we can easily give you those numbers, but also some of those costs that you may not and that we cannot estimate at this time would be the cost that it would, that the company would incur in order to set up the FTZ operation. As Brent mentioned earlier, there are some uh, security protocols that need to be in place prior to going live at your FTZ site. And those FTZ security protocols uh, are monitored by CBP and they would guide the company as to the best application and which type of security protocols they need in place. That may be everything from video monitoring to additional gates to maybe just 
uh, painting lines on the on the floor to even establishing just a a tangible uh, inventory control procedures manual so we can see how things going are going in and out of the facility. We have a second question. The second question is, how long does it take to set up an FTZ operation? The answer to that question is, it's pretty simple. Uh, with the expertise that Brent and I have in this market, we can have you up and running within four to six months. Now, we do have to understand that there is a application process that occurs at the local level as well as the federal level. And so there are some timing uh, procedures or protocols that we have to take into consideration. With that said, as I mentioned earlier, there is a responsibility of the company to make sure that they are up and running as well and that they comply with all of the necessary requirements that they need to follow. And so Brent and I can have you up and running within four or six months, but that is completely dependent on if the company can also have everything in place within four or six months. But if everything goes straight and, and seamless, four to six months is the best opportunity that we can start saving you thousands, hundred thousands, or millions of dollars in your operation. We have another question just popped up. Where can I learn more information about the FTZ program? Well, there are a number of different websites that you can visit, but one website that is that is beneficial to companies in our market is TampaFTZ.com. You can visit that, and it provides a very simple explanation of the FTZ program. And if you want additional information, you can also contact uh, Brent and myself, and we can provide a more detailed information for you so you can become that FTZ expert within your individual company. Are there any additional questions? If so, please type in the chat box because you are on mute and we cannot hear you. All right, well, I think that is all. We do not see another question uh, popping up on our chat box. And so with that, we would like to say goodbye. Thank you for your time. Uh, we hope that this FTZ webinar was informative and, and and helpful for you as you go forward and decide to go forward in the FTZ project or not. As I mentioned before, please contact Mr. Brent Barkway or myself, and we will be very willing to help you. And we also want to thank the Tampa Hillsborough EDC because the FTZ program is an economic development tool for our market. As we mentioned, we want more jobs to stay here, and the FTZ program is a way that we can make that work. And working together, we will make Tampa Bay an even better place to live. Thank you.